All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Barbell Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scott, and with me here today is Dr. Kyle Coffey. Dr. Kyle Coffey is someone uh, pretty special to me who has uh, been one of the main people in forcing me off the ledge into the world of cash-based physical therapy. Um, and I, as he said, I really took the bull by the horns here. Um, so I'm very thankful for him. He's was also a professor at UMass Lowell where I was, and um, I've been fortunate enough to do some learning from him about blood flow restriction training. And um, he's part of the modern manual therapy uh, mentorship and uh, course offerings that we have there uh, with our new one coming out too for uh, modern barbell therapy. So um, Kyle, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit, what you do, and um, you know, kind of what got you into uh, the world of BFR? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Kyle Coffey. Uh, I'm a physical therapist by trade. I always start with that. Even though I'm in higher education, I'm, I still think like a PT, act like a PT. Um, I was uh, treating patients for a number of years, still treat patients, but treating full time uh, when I got an opportunity to go and start teaching full time at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And uh, been doing that for uh, almost nine years now. I do uh, have my own uh, practice in, in southern New Hampshire, just me, solo, cash-based. Um, definitely don't see as many patients as I, as I would like to during the academic year, but definitely uh, upticks in the summer. So, uh, yeah, BFR. Um, BFR starts with me um, when I was in undergrad in college, I was playing uh, summer soccer with a bunch of friends. We had a team. and Did uh, we actually say what BFR was? I don't even know if we said blood flow restriction training no, yet. <laughs> yeah, see, this, this is where I'm kind of like just speaking with acronyms. Yeah, BFR is blood flow restriction. Let's start there. Um, I, I got introduced to blood flow restriction in college. I was a goalkeeper on a soccer team with friends, and, and I uh, – took a weird shot and, and shattered a, a couple of joints in my fingers. Um, had to have surgery on it. And I'm sitting at home trying to figure out how I can still work out and still train when I couldn't do the other thing that I really liked, which is cycling. I couldn't hold onto my handlebars um, and do that safely. So I was watching the Tour de France, um, like any good cyclist does in the summer. And I started to do some research about literally googling ways to to have high intensity exercise when you're hurt and blood flow restrictions started coming up and so i started diving into it deeper and and it kind of just jumped off from there um i mean historically blood flow restriction was used by power lifters and weight lifters um, they weren't doing anything in terms of the the practical application and the individual application that we're, we do now they were simply taking seat belts and tubing and wrapping around their arms and legs. And, and, you know, as primitive as that might be, they knew they were, there was a benefit to it. They would, they would get a muscle pump. They would get, um, you know, a lot of fatigue and soreness from their exercise, but then they would not have that same high level of muscle soreness that they might have if they were lifting heavy. Um, so, I just kind of really dove into it there and it, and it took off as I went into PT school when I started to realize that, you know, the majority of the patients that we see, at least in an outpatient general population um, setting, they're not able to lift at the levels, the intensities we need them to be at in order to gain muscle mass. And we were kind of stuck in this limbo of like, well, what do we do? You know, do we continue to do the same exercises and try to increase the number of reps and increase volume that way, which, you know, research has shown that you can gain muscle mass that way. It's just going to take a heck of a lot longer. Um, or is there, or is there a better way? And so I started really just applying it on myself and figuring out how we could use it better. And then with the research that's out there, I developed a, a continuing ed course on how to, you know, practically apply it. Because when we're talking about patients, we can't do it like the power lifters do and just take seat belts and <laughs> tubing and wrap it around our limbs and hope for the best. Yeah, absolutely. There's uh and a lot of this too goes back to like they used to do, and I think sometimes it still gets confused with 
occlusion training, which is like an ancient Chinese medicine or something like that, where they would just try to occlude an artery and train that way, which uh, is not the best idea for anyone trying to do that. But do you want to talk about that at all and kind of the history of BFR um, yeah. as a modality through um, its evolution here? Yeah, I think that's a good distinction to make. It is not blood flow occlusion. It is blood flow restriction. We are not fully occluding um, arterial inflow to an area. What blood flow restriction is, is we are trying to reduce um, venous return. So we're trying to get venous pooling um, in the limbs, in the exercising limbs. Uh, We know from a scientific standpoint that venous pooling uh, increases cell signaling for a whole host of things that we want to happen with exercise, namely muscle hypertrophy. Um, But we're not occluding it, right? We can occlude blood flow to an area at rest. And we do that all the time in surgeries. We can't do that with exercise because the muscles require the nutrients coming in and at least some removal of it during exercise. Um, And what we know with blood flow restriction, when we do that, we actually create an anabolic environment within the muscle. In other words, we create an environment where the body is actively trying to increase uh, muscle mass, all the good things we want with training. The kicker is, is we don't have to train at the high levels as we normally would, right? We don't have to get over or under a bar and lift heavy weights, which great. We want to get there eventually. But as I alluded to earlier, especially post-injury, post-surgery, a lot of patients can't lift heavy. And so we, this is a great opportunity for us to create that anabolic environment, still perform exercises at a lower intensity, get the benefits of higher intensity exercise, uh, and then eventually transition out of BFR. I think that's a really important statement too. It's like BFR is not going to uh, be a replacement for traditional high intensity strength training. I mean, get over, get under a bar, lift heavy, lift off, and sprinkle in some cardio. You're going to have a healthy life. We eventually need to get people there. Um, and so I think that's where BFR um, is, is really uh, – I hate using this phrase, but I'll use it because I can't think of anything else. Like game-changing. It gives us a, a really important tool for us to use um, to help people get to that point of – you know, getting back to their sport or lifting heavy and lifting often. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, there, there are some un- misunderstandings of it. And so, you know, I am a provider too, that, uh, uses blood flow restriction training quite frequently. And I have a lot of, uh, patients that lift in and clients that lift too, that, uh, want to learn more about, or have told me about their own self experimentation with it. And, and, um, Kyle, what would you say the biggest things are that are misunderstood about BFR and its application or use? Uh, I think first and foremost, BFR alone is not necessarily going to increase your strength. Um, Yes, with BFR, you're going to get more muscle mass. And the more muscle mass you have, the more force generation uh, capability you have. Um, But what we know is strength is also the central nervous system and how it controls our muscles. And the only way we can actually truly get stronger is by lifting heavy, lifting often. Um, So when we talk about BFR increasing strength, yes and no, right? It increases muscle mass, but to get really strong, we have to eventually transition away from BFR and get to that traditional high intensity strength training. Um, With that, BFR only really tackles muscle mass. It doesn't affect neuromuscular application. So in the rehab world, um, you know, just I'll give a a basic case study, but you post up ACL, post up meniscectomy, uh, and we're doing the 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 exercises that uh you know are allowed post surgery so that we're not uh causing any damage to any of the repair. Um Yes, building muscle is important there, but we also have to get better control of the muscles. So let's just hone in on the quads here and say quad sets are great and short arc quads are great and all these things are great early on. Um, BFR will help with increasing the muscle mass, but it doesn't do anything to help the coordination, synchronization of, of those muscle fibers. So 
you know, adding in neuromuscular electrical stimulation, NMES is really where a lot of people miss the boat on that, right? They, they forget that that's not covering, covering that. Um, and then I guess the other thing with BFR, and I've, I've mentioned it already, is it's not the be all end all. Eventually, we have to transition away from it. Um, what's interesting is there's, there's some research out there uh, of athletes, uh, higher level uh, gen pop clients um, using BFR um, as almost like a finisher. There was a study done that was like, if you're going to do some power based training, high intensity training, um, what happens um, if you do a, a short session of BFR directly after that training? Um, and what was found was it doesn't, there's nothing necessarily detrimental that occurs um, when you do it that way. However, you can have power output decreases for up to 48 hours afterward. So from a training standpoint, it's like it has its place in, in just general training, not just rehab, but we have to implement it correctly, if that makes sense, right? We have to thoughtfully put it where we want um, the most benefit. Yeah, and I can add to that too from my own uh, personal experience there is uh, I actually got into BFR. I discovered it in college as well, but it was through bodybuilding. A, a couple bodybuilders had started using it um, just for hypertrophy purposes and you could get a ton of load and they'd get these huge pumps and um, you know th they thought they would see benefit from it, which the data shows that you will get hypertrophy from it. Um, and bodybuilders don't necessarily care about strength. So I was on the bodybuilding program a while ago and I think I had to do like eight sets of 15 with BFR for like curls and triceps. Might've been a John Russin program actually. Yeah. That and, sounds like a John Russin FHT program, I think. Yeah. And I was the first couple of times I had done it, like I was super sore for days and we'll see that with people too, is even like a little bit of work with this will make you can make you significantly sore, which isn't a bad thing necessarily. It's saying maybe there's some type of biochemical thing going on where we're creating some adaptation. But yeah, just realize that like when you're doing this, like, you know, if you're doing with this for some chronic tendonitis, but you're still going to play in your game tomorrow, it, it might not be the best time to use it uh, the day before that. Right. And exercise prescription is exercise prescription. I, I mean, just because you're using something and you're doing lower loads doesn't mean you double down on the volume. Uh, you, you know, you still have to appropriately prescribe BFR, which, you know, any of the cases that we've seen in the research of, of injuries with BFR, which by the way, uh, in the vast majority of situations, BFR is very safe, but, but the instances where we've seen it's been a problem is when people over prescribe exercise under BFR and they end up really damaging themselves sometimes to the point of, of rhabdomyolysis, which is, you know, muscle, muscle breaking down. Um, that's an extreme case, right? But, but if we, if we program it correctly, it can be beneficial in rehab, in training, um, in, and not just, uh, resistance trained individuals or people looking to increase muscle mass or, or what have you also in aerobic athletes. Um, because, if we, if we understand the principles of how our body uses oxygen during exercise, it needs two things. It needs the cardiovascular system to pump blood to those working muscles. So it needs a higher heart rate and it needs more blood pumped per beat. But it also needs uh, more muscle tissue that is going to need that oxygen. And, and that's something called uh, AVO2 difference. So the more muscle we have, the more oxygen will be used um, the better off we are in terms of an aerobic, uh, capacity uh, as well. So, you know, it's got, it's got translation across many different things. However, it needs to be applied appropriately and exercise prescription is really important. So what would you say, um, or let's start with like, what are some of the common things people out there that, uh, especially people that, you know, train regularly, whether it be aerobic stuff, running, or weightlifting, what, and if, if someone was going to start trying this, what would the common dosage and application be of rep sets? How long should they do it? Uh, what intensities? So 
it it definitely is is individualized um but like general thoughts here we're probably talking about in an athletic population they don't have any injuries they're not in rehab and they're using bfr they're probably using it somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes no more probably three to five different exercises probably closer to three to four compound movements, multiple muscle groups. So your squat, your dead, your bench, your push-ups, your, your bigger um, compound uh, exercises. And you're doing probably three sets of, uh, for each exercise. Here's, here's where it gets a little out of the ordinary in terms of how you would normally prescribe uh, exercise. That first set, you're going to be doing upwards of 30 repetitions. And the reason why you're doing that is because you are intentionally trying to fatigue your body so that it will use, and I'm going to generalize here, it's going to use type 2 fibers more than type 1 fibers. Type 2 fibers are our anaerobic power strength fibers, again, to generalize. And our type 1 fibers are more of our aerobic uh, endurance type fibers. So by putting that high number of reps in the first sets, we're intentionally fatiguing the body. And then you back down for those subsequent sets, maybe 15, um, maybe 20. Again, it, it depends on the individual. Um, you don't need a lot with BFR. You really don't. Uh, if you are choosing exercises that are compound movements, multiple muscle groups, um, you're going to get fatigued pretty darn quickly. So you don't need to overdo it at all. Um, now, what's interesting when we look at like rehab versus training, Rehab is going to use BFR probably on a per visit basis, especially early on to build that muscle mass. Whereas in a training situation, you know, you may be using BFR once a week, twice a week, not, not every time. And you're being strategic. A lot of people will use it on deload weeks or deload days. And they're, they're just taking a rest day, but they're, you know, really passionate, really motivated, and they can't do nothing. They have to do something. So they'll put BFR on and maybe, you know, walk on a treadmill spin or just do really, really low load stuff. Um, so there's a dichotomy there too, in terms of how it's applied based on the setting. Um, and would you say there is harm in trying to go outside of the norm of that, um, prescription of doing less reps in doing like, you know, in the five to 10 rep range or anything like we don't necessarily need to max out and like, yes, we can use um, minimal exercise and get some of these hard reps, but like some of my strength athletes and things like some people, you know, they're, they're just not motivated by 30 reps, even if it's going to get them better. Um, so is there any harm in doing, um, you know, it, and the BFR can really make things tiring and harder than someone would expect. So, they might start out with their first few reps and, and be fine. And then by rep 10, 12, like on their first set, they're like, oh crap, this is really hard. And like, I feel, you know, not pain, but discomfort of like the, the pooling of the blood and the, the, the pump that people would get from it. Right. Yeah. On that? yeah. And that's where it's like, you could say, start with 30 reps, start with 20 reps, whatever, monitor them see what they're doing. If they start really getting fatigued at 15, well, guess what? Their first set is 15. And now you back it down to maybe 10 or eight for subsequent or whatever it may be. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is at least in my world, uh, more in the rehab world, I'm doing BFR pretty much just body weight or very minimal weight. Uh, you know, for instance, if you're doing bicep curls with it, uh, five pounds, we're not, it's very, very minimal. Now in the training and athletic world, um, you have someone who has a, a good training history. They've been training for a long time. They've got good programming. They've got a great base of strength and, a, and muscle mass and, and power. You can add in a percentage of their one RM, but even then we're talking 10, 15, probably no more than 20% one RM, which we know without BFR would be like, what are we doing here? This is, this is pointless. Um, so there are ways to kind of modify it based on the individual's certain circumstances. Um, it's just being mindful of that. And again, going back to the exercise prescription, 
kind of little tangent was it, it's the proper uh, prescription here. We don't have to overdo this. And if that includes, as you were saying, um, yeah, we, we wanted to do 20 reps, 30 reps on the first set, but we're getting to 15 or 20 and we're smoked. Well, that's where we are, right? And that may change exercise to exercise. That might happen on a squat, but not on a push-up or what have you. And that's okay. The key is high number of reps in the first set and then back it down for subsequent sets. Yeah. And, um, uh, there's a lot of good things that we could go from, f- go with from here. So, um, I guess another thing, and this is something I actually have a interesting patient now who he just had a hip display as a sh- surgery and he had his labrum done before that six months before that. And now he just tore his distal bicep again. Um, <sighs> So yeah, he's, he's a big jujitsu guy and, um, he's just like it, we're doing well. And we've been doing BFR with his lower extremity. Now he can't use his arm. And he's like, this is, he texted us the other day and was like, this is my nine one one call. Like I need a workout program. He's just, he functions in life with exercise. So, um, one of my first thoughts was, well, you know, and we've been using BFR for his lower extremity anyways, but can we throw that on there? And, um, I know for some people, uh, even just watching them anecdotally in the clinic, like, is there some type of cardiac response that happens as well? Um, with the BFR, uh, I know a lot of people like, will be like, wow, like this is, you know, tiring and and exerting and they'll, you'll, I notice, and I, I can't tell if it's that they're doing 20 to 30 reps and they're not used to it, even though it's body weight. Or is there an ex- extra piece of a cardiac response that happens with BFR? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, your cardiovascular system will have to work harder. Everything works harder at that lo- those lower intensities using BFR. I mean, if you think about it, right, we are restricting venous return. And what venous return is is the amount of blood that's coming back to the heart so that your heart can then pump it out again after it's reoxygenated by, by the lungs. So if we're we're restricting that venous return, um, we are not getting as much blood back to the heart. That means the heart's going to have to pump a little bit faster and a little bit harder to get whatever blood is coming back out as quickly as possible. So we generally see a higher um, cardiovascular response at lower loads than if we did if they were doing no BFR and and slightly higher loads. So that's that's a, you know... Um, consideration in terms of medical history for people. Um, But it's also something we can work with, right? We know, um, and it kind of seems like uh, this is what your, your patient kind of needs is that, that mental health aspect of exercise that like that euphoria, that endorphin release, right? Well, we know just exercise at higher intensities gives that to us. Lower intensities, yeah, we get a little bit of it, but we need to be moderate, higher higher intensity to really get that release. So in this case, if this patient is, I just need to move, right? That's really what he's saying. I just need to move. I can't sit here. I can't, I have to do something. Putting BFR on, having him walk at a, a, a pretty, not a jog, if he's still got lower extremity issues going on, but at, at a, a high enough pace and also at an incline, can really have that cardiac response, which also drives all, a lot of the biochemical stuff that happens in our brain from a from a, an emotional, mental aspect as well. So, um, yeah, it, I I like to I like to say this, and it's kind of corny, but I think it gets the point across. BFR is like the spice in a in a recipe, not the main ingredient. And what I mean by that is anything we can. Anything that a, a client or a patient enjoys, anything a client or a patient needs to do because it makes them happy, we can still do that with BFR. We just got to sprinkle in a little bit, sprinkle a lot in other instances, uh, adjust the exercise prescription, um, and, and we can still get benefits from it. So in that case, I'm like, yeah, let's get that guy on the bike, salt bike. Let's get him doing something, getting his heart rate up, getting him feeling like he's doing high intensity stuff, even though he really isn't. That it tricks the mind. It's a very weird feeling, right? When you, when you have a cuff on and you're just doing five pound dumbbell curls, 10 pound dumbbell curls and your brain sweating. (laughs) Yeah. Your brain saying this, there's, there's a mismatch going on here. 
um, we can use that to our advantage though, in, in a case like that patient that you're describing. Well, and things actually, like we did it in, in your course of you put one arm, one, a cuff on one arm and one arm doesn't have the cuff and you hold like a 20 pound med ball and it feels significantly heavier in the arm that has the cuff that's being restricted. Uh, so that's another aspect of, I guess, in a sense, it changes your perspective of load. It yeah. might be 20% of load, but it's going to change your perspective of how heavy it feels and be able to give you that sense of uh, effort and fatigue a little bit more. But um, that brings up a question for me too, is what does the, because I haven't really used it a ton in like a cardiac perspective, but what what would a cardio protocol look like with BFR? Yeah, so similar to what we have our guidelines from the National Strength and Conditioning Association, ACSM, American College of Sports Medicine, you know, they say we have to be at like 70% of 1RM to, uh, to see muscle hypertrophy. Obviously, we can be lower. It's just going to take a longer time, but that's kind of the optimal range. Uh, for aerobic, we, we have to be at about 40% of our VO2 max or higher. Now, most people in facilities don't have a metabolic heart to um, to get accurate VO2 measurements, nor do they want to take the time to do a submaximal field test for VO2 max. So we can translate that because there's a linear relationship between heart rate and VO2 max. Essentially, what we're saying is 40% of heart rate max or higher. Um, and when when I when you take that into perspective, again, 40% of heart rate max without BFR wouldn't do anything. It would be like the most boring, slow run you've ever done in your entire life. But when you do that under BFR, now, now we're cooking with, with fire here. We can, we can change some things around. So the way I love to do it, regardless of whether it's bike, um, whether it's um, treadmill, uh, whatever, uh, rowing, is I like to do interval training. Um, because underneath that or with that BFR on, you're not going to be able to uh, run as fast as you'd like to. Um, you're not going to be able to bike as fast or as hard as you can. So doing whatever interval ratio you want to do, whether it's the classic two to one, three to one, three to two, you are pushing that, getting that cardiovascular response. You're backing it down a little bit. Uh, you're only going to be able to do that again, probably for 15 to 20 minutes. It's going to fatigue you out pretty darn quickly. Um, but it's also, an, again, from an exercise prescription standpoint, a nice way to make cardio, I don't want to say more effective, uh, but more enjoyable, right? Sometimes people just don't want to do cardio and they need that little kick. Um, you could add that in if you wanted to on a car cardio uh, aerobic side of things as well. It doesn't just have to be uh, resistance training. And with some of the manual systems um, out there, the ones that aren't um, tethered to any you know little computer or whatever, you could do swimming as well. If someone wanted to swim and do laps in a pool and do you know do that as your interval, they could do that as well. Will you fall upside down? <laughs> With them on your legs. <laughs> yeah, right. Every, er, everyone in the pool is gonna think you have floaties on for adults. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know what? You know what's funny in the in the rehab world when I'm when I'm when I'm teaching my course to to PTs and we talk about aquatic therapy, I, I make the joke, but it's so true. It's like you can only flap your arms and legs and use as much styrofoam. There, there's a limit to all of that when you're in the pool, right? And BFR yeah. actually can help you get that next step if they really can't transition from aquatic to land yet, if, if they're, they're in between. Yeah. Uh, and so for the aerobic, would you say you'd still limit that to about a 20 minute session? Again, depends on the person, but I, I'm also looking at it regardless of what setting you're in rehab or training, there's other stuff you're going to want to do. Yeah. It's not, you're not going to just do cardio. You're not just going to do strength in rehab. I'm not just doing manual therapy and therex. Uh, I had modalities. I get this. I get, there might be a whole, you know, buffet of things that I want to do. So I say from a physiological standpoint, but also a practical standpoint, you're probably not going to be doing it more than 15, 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Can people up their tolerance to it though? Like we, we said, like 
I did 20 minutes of it before, like when I first started, it was really sore. I never went and progressed it more than that because I just, I felt it was sufficient enough and it was the spice at the end of my workout, whatever. But if someone wanted to, could they build up to like a 45 minute session? Would it be a bad idea to do that? No, it's not bad. Again, as long as, as uh, they're being monitored, they're not having any symptoms that we would say, all right, we got to discontinue this. Um, you can absolutely do that. Again, I would argue if you're going to be building up towards 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just lift heavy. Yeah. Just get under or over a bar. Do that instead. Yeah. Uh, now, now, having said that, there are there are reasons why you might do BFR instead of lifting. Again, maybe you're maybe you're tapering down uh, for whatever reason uh, towards an event, towards a competition, and you, and you still want to be active, but you don't want to lift heavy. Fine, I could see it there. But if you're using that as your primary mode uh, of training, um, and and especially if your goal is strength, true strength, and your goal is true true power, that's when I say you know let's let's move away from that. Um, you're right though; it would take a long time uh, it, to build that up because um, you would have to let the body adapt and build up the buffering capabilities uh, of of dealing with the. Uh, all the metabolites that get kind of uh, pooled up in, in the limbs and that, and that would take time, but you can certainly do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, with that being said, one of the other things I remember from the course is uh, nerve conduction velocity is actually slowed, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, you're not just putting this cuff on and inflating it and it's solely impacting the vascular system, right? Veins and veins and arteries. It is going to, to compress, um, nerves. Um, now obviously you don't want numbness and tingling. That's too much compression. That's one of those things where we back off a little bit. Um, but just by, from a physiological standpoint, the compression of that nerve, you're going to get a little bit uh, of a slower nerve conduction velocity. So I don't know if this is where you were going with this, but I'm going to mention it now that it comes to my head is like, I don't really see an instance where I'm going to be doing speed or velocity based stuff with BFR. I'm not going to be doing Olympic lifts. There's just no point to me. It doesn't seem like it's going to have a benefit for most people. Could I, again, there's always these what ifs, right? Could I see a scenario maybe where we have a very well-trained athlete, someone who has that good base, who has really good Olympic lifting form, who maybe we're trying to challenge the system in a slightly different way and we do it very lo low weight. Um, I don't know. Probably not. We'll see. Um, I would argue again, in that instance, very similar to the, I can do BFR for 45 minutes. If you're, if your first inkling with Olympic lifts and to progress it is to do BFR. No, I, I don't, I don't think that you fully investigated all the opportunities to progress that person appropriately. Like that shouldn't be your first thought. <laughs> well, yeah, I've seen, so I would, uh, so as an Olympic weightlifting coach myself, I have never and never planned to do BFR <laughs> with Olympic lifting. Just, I bring just go the, on Instagram and see what's out there. <laughs> yeah, true. I, maybe I'll try. No, <laughs> that no, changes no. my plan. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> my my thought, and this was kind of a word of caution to anyone trying this, is um, I vaguely remember too. So, so for those that don't know, nerve conduction velocity um, basically is the speed at which your messages travel from your brain for your limbs or body to, to move. Uh, and one day I was doing BFR and I was doing a landmine press and I went to transfer my hands and it was like, my hands were just dumb and not attached to the rest of my brain. And I slipped and almost took my teeth out, my bottom row of teeth out. And I was like, I just didn't feel that coordination to like grab the bar the right way. And I was like, I think this is just slow nerve conduction velocity. So um, there was you know, that's a safety a, that's aspect a, there. Yeah, That's uh, a good point though, too, because uh, I'll just piggyback off of that and say, let's not use, let's not use BFR on more complex activities. If we haven't already taught someone how to do those activities, 
without BFR, right? Because there is that aspect of safety of, of it is affecting, um, especially as you fatigue, how, I don't want to say coordinated you are, but there is a, the fatigue will not just be in the muscle. It will be throughout everything well, that's going on. And if you can't react as fast because the conduction velocity is slowed, well, yeah, because I saw someone doing like they had some athletes, they were all doing BFR and they were doing the agility hurdles and the ladders and everything else. And I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. Like we're training in a slowed rate. Like, why would we want to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and then like, I've seen people try to train balance with it before. And I was like, well, if the conduction is slowed, you're making, why are you going to make someone worse at something and then have them try to do it? Well, doesn't make R sense to me. Correct. Now I could see a scenario where you're doing some, some BFR, uh, training, and then you take those off and then you go into some plyometrics, some agility stuff, and you are essentially training, you know, strike while the iron's hot. You have, you have really fatigued that system. Now you're asking it to do it, not with BFR on, but you're, you're training in that way a little bit. I could see that, but with BFR on, again, it's, I, I, I can't say that you're necessarily doing anything bad or detrimental. I just don't think you're actually accomplishing what you think you're accomplishing, if that makes sense, right? Correct. Um, my other question to you here was um, in its application and who almost is a better fit for this is, you know, I I have a really cool case now where I have a – 72 year old female um she's masters national champion power lifter and so she's 71 or 72 and she squats over 200 pounds she deadlifts 245 pounds she benches uh 137 i think she's very strong for her age and she's got a significant amount of muscle mass but she just had a hip replacement um and we we actually used BFR preoperatively because she couldn't load that well. Uh, she's going in for surgery. She's going to be off that hip for a while. Uh, she was unloading. She had to use a cane. Like it got really bad really fast. Uh, and it was a great application then to maintain while she couldn't load. But now she's back to loading and doing all these things. And I'm just kind of like, do I do I want to use BFR with her still? She's two months out of surgery. She's back in. You know, she is a different. She's my 2% out of the curve of norm where uh, she's repping, she was repping 20 reps, you know, a week and a half post-op with BFR cuffs on. Um, she's back to doing hip hinging and all this and step ups without any assistance. And she's maintained most of her muscle mass. And I think part of it, she's just neurologically, she's, you know, innervated that way. Uh, and she's kept most of her muscle. More than, you know, I have 45-year-old women in the gym who can barely do a step up on their own and they're considered healthy. So is there uh, a population where, is this actually more beneficial for people that might be a little more frail that we need to build mass with versus people that are um, stronger and have more muscle mass? Is there less bang for your buck with them at all? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I always joke and I say, if you're human and you're breathing, you can use BFR, right? Again, there's there's situations, there's risk stratification, certain conditions where we probably wouldn't use it. But when you start subsectioning it out into strong versus weak individuals, we'll just call it that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like any sort of training. Those who are, are, who are deconditioned um, are going to see the largest increases from exercise and training compared to someone who's strong, right? The, the, they're going to see it a lot quicker. So definitely in in weaker individuals, deconditioned individuals, BFR is that like Goldilocks. It is, it allows them to get moving. It allows them to build strength. If they're fear avoidant, it allows them to do things that they are okay with doing and still build some muscle mass over time. If they're painful, um, it helps with that. So yeah, I think if if I had to choose, it probably is going to be more helpful for for weaker individuals. Um, but with that being said, in that in particular uh, person you're working with, 
you know, if, even though she's strong, uh, if she came out, out of that, that total hip and she wasn't able to return to a lot of that stuff, well then, yeah, that's going to be, again, someone who needs that endorphin release, needs that exercise, wants that exercise. BFR is perfectly fine in that instance, but again, transition out of that as quickly as possible and get them, them lifting. Yeah. And that was my thought is like, well, we're, you know, her goal is strength and we, we have an adequate amount of muscle mass. We kept it. Like we used BFR was a great application for her pre-surgery preoperatively, but now it's like, okay, she can do step ups. She can do all these things. She's kind of already unrestricted at this point. And it's only been six weeks. Do I want to use BFR or do I want to get her stronger again? No, I think actually use BFR with her where you should have, and that's prehab. I think that's one area where we can really kind of push home the the importance or helpfulness of BFR. You know, we know it's a fact. The more muscle mass you have prior to a surgery, the better off you will have as outcomes. End of story, right? So even in someone like her who was already a high level of fitness for her age, Doing that beforehand so that she didn't lose any of that muscle mass is probably what helped contribute to the fact that she didn't need BFR on the back end, right? That she could go to back to those things. Again, obviously, the level of fitness, the base that she had. Um, but yeah, using BFR in a prehab world uh, setting is is really impactful. Yeah. And um, we talked a lot about muscle mass, and that's very important for a lot of us. But what are some of the other benefits too uh, that we get or the adaptations we see from using BFR, whether it be um, cartilage, ligaments, does all that stuff grow? What happens there? Pain? So, right, yeah. So growth hormone is released along with um, some other happy, feel good things for, for muscle hypertrophy and growth. And, and so growth hormone is, is definitely our repair and regrow, um, hormone. So you would think in theory that if that is released in higher concentrations, that we could get some benefit, um, with tendonitis, tendinopathies, uh, you know, soft tissue type of, of, uh, injuries, um, the evidence out there is is conflicting. I think it's getting better, more supportive. I also think it's a product of how we're measuring things. I think that's part of it. Um, but again, I go back to this. What What's the alternative? If we had someone who had chronic tendonitis or tendinopathy and they can't do normal things that we want to do, are we just going to do nothing with them? Or are we going to try BFR and hope that, you know, again, even though the research isn't, 100% there yet, that it would be something that will benefit this person. I always go, let's, let's stay away from not doing anything and, and, and work towards that. Um, in terms of pain, that one's always a challenging one. How do you measure pain, right? Other than a subjective scale. Um, but what I will say is that there's a couple of good studies out there that show um, after using BFR, and this was for, I believe, patellofemoral uh, it was a knee related condition. Um, I know that, um, after doing a, sh a short session of BFR that individuals reported, uh, a reduction in pain, uh, for 24 hours, some up to 72 hours afterwards. Now, is that due to the BFR or is that the fact that we just got them moving? We got them exercising. And when we exercise, the body feels better. Um, again, not entirely sure there. However, if BFR is what got them to move so that that could happen, that's a positive in, in, in my book. Um, so yeah, hypertrophy, muscle mass, um, some, some research showing reduction in pain, um, some research showing support for helping with soft tissue related stuff. Um, but the big one is, is muscle mass gain. That's something we, we know the re the research there is, is solid. Yeah. Somebody the, the other day came in and asked if we did ultrasound and I was like, I just pointed to the cuff. I was like, no, I do that. It's like, what's that? I was like, it's BFR. They're like, I was like, this replaces the need for basically any passive modality uh, besides soft tissue work. I still use a lot of that and, and I do the, my fair share of dry needling and things too. But like, you know, just rubbing 
cream on it with the machine that basically does nothing or a tens unit like bfr does all that and more so why are we why don't we choose something that someone actively can participate in get the sense that movement is better it's an active solution to an active problem let's use that all day it's also an empowerment tool too i mean exactly. it, it, what what is our role as pts well even as strength coaches right we i mean yes we want people to come back we want them to enjoy us and and what we provide for our services and to refer people to us but ultimately when we when it really comes down to it we want be, people to understand how their body works and how they can k- take care of it. Ultrasound's not going to do that. BFR is going to get you to realize that exercise is helpful, that moving's helpful. And so to me, it's like, yeah, replace – it doesn't have to be BFR. Let's just replace modalities in general that are not effective um, with things that um, that are effective but also – actively engage the patient in their treatment. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, my last question before we have to wrap up here is, um, is this something people should try on their own? Should they go try to find a provider that does this for them? And if so, how would they go about doing this on their own? Yeah, I think in general, right? The majority of people should be um, consulting a, a clinician, a provider who has been trained in BFR and using it with them. Uh, there are going to be some instances where, you know, someone's had been using it for a while and maybe that individual clinician or provider feels comfortable saying, yes, you can use it at home, but that's going to be few and far between. Um, when, when you're looking for somebody, uh, or when you're what? looking to do BFR, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, what is the reason for that? Or what, are, what would be some of your reasonings for that? I think um, while BFR is safe, uh, has been shown to be safe, the research shows that it's it's not really increasing the risk of adverse events that uh, significantly in a vast majority of the population. I think once you remove it and put it in a situation where there's more variable for error, um, that safety risk is not as solid. And so for me, I just say, let's keep this with us. And then let me give you things that at home that are also beneficial that I, that I know there's less variability in error with, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Right. Yeah. Inherent inherently, I think people could be trained to use it at home. Uh, but as a clinician and a provider, I'm trying to minimize risk and maximize benefit. And I just see too, too much potential for that happening if it becomes an at-home thing. Yeah, I've seen a lot of guys just slapping these things on their legs at the gym or whatever and doing these ridiculous workouts sometimes. And it's like, you know, that's one thing. But we also have to keep in mind um, for everyone out there too, or you telling mom and dad that they should try this because they should put on muscle mass again, is like we have to think about blood pressures, heart rates, heart condition or cardiovascular conditions. Um, even, you know, I've had a couple of people, they, they kind of push themselves a little hard on it and like, you know, got lightheaded and dizzy because the cardiac response isn't what they expected, uh, or was something they weren't ready for. And, uh, you know, or, and sometimes it's like, I had a woman that did it in the morning, like she hadn't eaten breakfast yet. And for whatever reason, she had too much coffee and it was just like all that together, you know, just made for a bad day for, for her, for me, whatever. Correct. And um, I think there's a whole host of complications and things we need to look out for um, that we as just regular civilians that aren't medically trained need to think about and worry about a little bit more. Um, you know, doing it to yourself as an experiment is one thing, but telling others to do it or even as yeah. coaches, um, you know, as coaches, we we can be certified to do it. But I think there's real importance in knowing uh knowing what you know and what you don't know. And if you don't know something and someone has any little type of comorbidity or medical complication, I might want to consult with a a doctor first or a medical provider that's trained in this first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Now, uh, what I was going to say was, um, you know, well, how do I know if someone's been trained in it? How do I know if someone's been certified? Um, Well, there's a a bunch of different certifications out there. all the ones that I'm aware of are, are good in the sense of they are uh, evidence-based, scientific-based, uh, and they teach people how to appropriately 
uh, apply BFR with their patients and clients. Um, there's no set certification. Uh, there's a couple of ones out there. Um, however, there is a new resource um, that uh, is, I think, going to be helpful. Uh, and that is uh, BFRpros.com. It's, it was created by um, uh, one of the colleagues in the field. Uh, and he has kind of created this website of uh, uh, clinicians and providers who sign themselves up and they uh, show that they've been trained in BFR so that you know, if you're a patient, if you're a client and you're looking to, uh, to, uh, find someone in your area that you can work with, um, this is a, this is a good resource for that. I think I just got invited to that page too, and I didn't know uh, that's what it was. So I'll yeah, have to go sign up yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry, Nick, if you're hearing this, I haven't had the chance to do it either, but I will because. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and, uh, wrapping thing else, is there anything else you wanted to add about BFR Kyle? Uh, no, I, I think it's, let me just recap and say this. I, it's, it, it's a powerful tool when used correctly, just like anything else. Um, and so find people who are going to be in your corner and help you use it and, and also know when not to use it. As we mentioned, if, if your goal is truly strength and power, it's probably good for a little bit, but it's not the be all end all. Um, no, other than that, uh, I think I, I'm, I'm good, man. All right, Kyle, where do people find you? Uh, you can find me uh, at, at my website, modusptperformance.com, M-O-T-U-S. Uh, I do have some social, but uh, to be quite honest, I try to stay off of those things as much as possible. I just have better things to do with my time. But uh, if you want to find me there, at moduspt, M-O-T-U-S-P-T, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and Facebook. All right. Thanks for coming on, Kyle. And uh, if anyone has any questions, feel, re feel free to reach out to either Kyle or myself. And uh, stay tuned for the next few episodes. We've got a few other um, really solid guests coming on talking about uh, pain science, talking about uh, functional medicine, and a few others that I can't think of off the top of my head. So stay tuned and thanks for tuning in.